and hello again. In a net zero world, world, smart mobility is clean mobility with technology as the driver of safe and less polluting solutions. Although great progress is being made, a number of challenges remain. There are still technical, economic, and communications barriers. How to make clean mobility possible, economically viable, and attractive in the eyes of its users. So to discuss these pressing issues, I'm joined by a fantastic panel this evening, a group of experts representing a wide range of viewpoints on the future of transport. Joining me here is Dr. Christian Brook, President and CEO of Siemens Energy, and Raji Hatar, the Chief Sustainability Officer at Aramex. And joining us down the line remotely is the founder and President, Chairman of Formula E, Alejandro Agag. Hello, Alejandro. Thank you for being with us. Hello, Blake. And Christian, I'd like to turn it to you and start, have you start us off. We just heard from Mr. Douglas on the future of aviation fuels, and I know that Siemens Energy is a partner on these efforts, and so I'm hoping you can tell us a bit more about the future for sustainable jet fuel. No, happy to do so, and, and it's a pleasure to be part of the panel. Thank you very much. Um, Obviously, together with Etihad and other partners, uh, Lufthansa is one, but uh, also Mubadala and also uh, University here, um, we are trying to really define a path to sustainable aviation fuel. One is producing green hydrogen and from green hydrogen then producing uh, a synthetic fuel which really would be net zero. And that is something where we look into how can we design the first pilot and from the first pilot then getting to commercial scale. As uh, Mr. Douglas just um, explained, I mean, the first uh, plants, uh, the cost will be higher. We are trying to find ways, obviously, on how can we best optimize it. And that is one element which we are driving forward. And it's now really about getting started, getting something really designed, getting it on the ground. <laughs> Because I think uh, if you talk about energy transition and sustainability, you can debate forever. If you do not start at one point in time really putting things on the ground, it will not start. And uh, we started here uh, in Dubai, actually, with the first green hydrogen plant together with Devar. Um, we are currently constructing down in Chile, actually, together with Porsche as an automotive supplier to develop a synthetic uh, automotive fuel plant. And here in, obviously, UAE, we intend really then to launch it together with uh, Etihad and, and Lufthansa and other <coughs> partners to show on how can you make aviation more sustainable. In terms of aviation fuel, I think it sounds like a bit of a pipe dream that we would ever have a sustainable alternative fuel powering jets. It sounds wild. I heard you just say green hydrogen. What is the, is it a biofuel? What is the, what is the mix? Is this still something that needs to be innovated? Well, I think, uh, I mean, first of all, you start off renewable energy. So the question is, how can you turn renewable energy in a, in a molecule which you can use, for example, in a turbine or in an engine or whatever? And in this case, in aviation fuel, obviously, in, in a jet engine. Um, so what you start off renewable energy, you convert it via electrolysis into a green hydrogen molecule, and then you still need to make, together with CO2, which you can, for example, capture from the air, capture from an off-gas stream, uh, you create uh, a hydrocarbon fuel which in the balance is net zero because you recycle the CO2 in this fuel and you're continuously injecting the green hydrogen. So we're talking about a net zero fuel. The, absolutely, that is the idea. And uh, as was uh, laid out before in, in, the, in the interview, with this having the ability to use existing aircraft designs or slightly modified aircraft designs. I believe strongly you will have in all types of transportation a variety of solutions. All electric, synthetic fuel, pure hydrogen, and you need this optionality because you have different problems to resolve. Thank you, that's really interesting. And so from the world of aviation over to motorsports, I want to ask you, Alejandro, um, just what you have learned at this intersection of the energy transition and the electrification of motorsport. I'm sure you've faced plenty of challenges, but what are some of the lessons learned and where are you still innovating? Well, uh, hello and how, uh, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, when we started, uh, you know, the, the electric uh, motorsport, uh, let's say, uh, path uh, 10 years ago. Um, people thought we were we were crazy. We were coming from Formula One and from other motorsports. We decided to create an electric car championship. And mainly we got two two results out of it. 
Um, of course, the first one is awareness. So when by having a, a race that it's electric, people see electric cars going around cities uh, around the world, going fast, and they, they get closer, one step closer to maybe buying an electric car. The other one, of course, is technology. You can uh, develop technology in racing, and this has been happening for a long time in, in traditional racing, Formula One, IndyCar. Uh, and then that technology can be used on the road cars and make better the road cars. But what we've learned is, of course, um, that, you know, the path is, is a slow one. Uh, the, the transition is, gonna, is not going to happen overnight. Um, I agree um, with my previous speaker that uh, there is going to be the need for a mix of solutions. Uh, we are pushing batteries for now because it's the only thing that works for a race. But we are looking very closely at uh, hydrogen fuel cells for example, to power race cars. At the moment, safety has been a big concern when using hydrogen, which is, uh, you know, which, which, which you know, can, uh, if, you, if the car crashes, can create all sorts of uh, problems. But definitely the, the mix will be necessary and the combination will be necessary. And synthetic fuels, it's a very interesting one where they're carbon neutral, but in a way, it's a little bit like cheating, but, but it may be a necessary cheating. All right. We'll move on from cheating, but I want to ask you a follow-up question on batteries. So batteries have been the standard bearer so far, but they do have end-of-life issues and, you know, what happens to them after they've been used. Can you talk a little bit about if Formula E has made any efforts on this front and what are some of the sort of unsolved mysteries of, of this issue still? So every, every one of the technologies we're talking about has pros and cons. Mm -hmm. And uh, hydrogen has 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 pros and cons, it's, it's, it's not very efficient and it's very difficult to store. Definitely batteries are, are a major challenge of, uh, of electric cars. Um, for Formula E, it's not a big problem because we use, we use the batteries at the real top of their capacity. So as soon as they lose 5% of, uh, of their performance, we can use them for something else, but not for racing, because for racing, you need them at really top. So our batteries have a second life and a third life. But then, of course, there is the question of recycling the batteries. And uh, recycling batteries, uh, you use energy for that. So it's not a perfect solution. New chemistries are coming through all the time, and improvements on capacity of batteries are coming on all the time. Just to give you an example, when we started Formula E, we were using two cars per driver because the battery couldn't have the energy to finish the race. So when the battery of the first car was <coughs> over, there would be a pit stop, and they would jump on the second car and finish the race. After three years, we managed to do the race only with one car. So that shows how much batteries are progressing. But, you know, definitely it's it's a weak point of, uh, of electric cars, but nobody's perfect. That's so interesting. Okay, so from two cars to one, that is that is a quantum leap and an improvement. <laughs> uh, Mr. Hajar, over to you. Just to talk logistics, you took up your post as a sustainability officer about 13 years ago. And since then, we've seen an e-commerce boom in the region. Yeah. Increasingly, consumers expect faster and faster shipping and are just ordering just more and more online. So how do you balance RMX's net zero targets, which are very ambitious, with our insatiable consumer appetite? Well, actually, you just mentioned that the consumer appetite is driving the whole thing now, and people want to order something and receive it in 15 minutes, and if you are late five minutes, there's a big problem. Uh, what we are doing, first of all, we are a very light asset-based company, so we don't own our assets, we lease them. Uh, so on the, on the fleet side, where we control, that's easier. Uh, since 2008, we started uh, looking at Euro 4, Euro 5 standard vehicles. It par it's part of our procurement policy, so nobody is allowed to go and lease any vehicle that's not Euro 4, Euro 5 standard, which cuts our uh, uh, fuel usage by 25%. Again, it cuts your emissions by 25%. Uh, we started toying with uh, hybrid vehicles also at that time, but unfortunately, hybrid did not go commercial. Uh, 2016, we started testing electric vehicles. And currently, we have a fleet of 10 vehicles in Jordan, and we're, we had plans to move Dubai and Saudi last year and this year. Unfortunately, with the semiconductors issue now, suppliers are not able to deliver, and also the issue of heat in this part of the world. Uh, on the, and that's scope one and two of our emissions. Now, scope three is owned by our subcontractors, so we, can, we do not have a huge input there, but we started working with them. Airlines, uh, we already signed an agreement to one of the airlines to use uh, sustainable aviation fuel as of January 1st. Now we are, to, we are in talks with other airlines, one of them is uh, Etihad, to start utilizing these uh, types of fuels. Now we know for a fact that uh, electrification is not the future. 
hydrogen is going to be the future because of too many things. One of them is what you mentioned, recycling batteries and the, you know, the, the, the hazard that is happening over there. Uh, to prevent this, actually, when we signed the agreement with the car manufacturer where we got our electric vehicles, the agreement said any vehicle, any battery that goes out of order will be shipped back to the supplier for recycling. So we're not going to have any batteries in the, our areas of operations. So that's uh, that's how we are looking at it. So EVs to start number one priority, but hydrogen is your future. Yes. That transitions me perfectly over to you, Christian, because I did really want to ask you about hydrogen. You mentioned green hydrogen, green hydrogen before, but where are we at on the timeline, and what can we expect from hydrogen, really? Yeah. First of all, I think I mean uh, for me, hydrogen is one part to the solution. It's not the silver bullet which solves all the problems, and I, I think this is how we have to look on it. Uh, first of all, if I see where we are today in terms of technologies to produce, for example, green hydrogen, um, I think we are on the stage where we can. We are one company who can put out uh, systems which produce green hydrogen from renewable energy. Um, the costs are too high still, uh, very clearly. So it's about now getting the supply chain in place, automize, uh, automating the processes and getting costs down. Um, and the systems are still too small and power renewable power obviously has to be very very cheap to get um, uh, to competitive hydrogen prices but uh, i think if you talk about this hydrogen transition um, we have always to keep in mind that we will have different markets which at a different point in time have a commercial case and transport or heavy transport in particular is, is one which will be relatively fast coming because there is a specific value to have a sustainable fuel um, there are certain hard to abate industries like steel or chemicals, which then probably will follow. And the power sector is probably in terms of the cost, which it can afford in terms of green hydrogen, the last one to follow. So you could construct today already a case where you could be very close to commercial application. You see these countries which have a CO2 pricing scheme of $100 per ton, where you see it can already work. But obviously, we all uh, need to work on the systems itself in terms of durability, operability, cost down, and so forth. So I expect we obviously have a couple of years ahead. I always uh, claim that I believe we will have a commercial market towards the end of the decade. That's my expectation. And there are still obviously now steps to be taken to really make sure that the market is growing and the supply chain can be built up. Mm -hmm. I want to switch gears again. This is a, <laughs> a disparate panel, to be sure, but thank you for weighing in on hydrogen. Alejandro, I want to ask you about just navigating regulations, prototyping, and public relations, and accomplishing really a lot in the past decade. But when you think about creating disruption in, you've created disruption in motorsport, but thinking about creating disruption just in the wider transportation sector, what advice do you have for others elsewhere in this industry for effectively shaking up the status quo and bringing others along with you for the ride? Uh, I mean, I, I don't know if I have um, any specific advice. I mean, we we have been um, in a world that traditionally was uh, very anti-electric. Uh, uh, if you look at motor racing and, you know, we still feel it. And me, myself, I come from... Uh, I used to I used to run a, a GP2, which is a Formula Two team, which you know it doesn't get more noisy than that. It doesn't get more fuel smell. It doesn't get more combustion than that. And I of course love that kind of racing. Um, and and you know we came in with electric uh, racing cars, and a lot of the people racing in traditional combustion cars saw us a bit of a as, as a threat. Um, clearly, combustion in in the in the world of racing is trying to survive, and and uh, the, the case of uh, e-fuels or synthetic fuels is a very interesting one. And like I say, there, there may be a valid solution uh, if we sort out the, the, the price problem, and we were talking about aviation before, um, and, the, and the volume problem. But um, in a way, there are ways for these old racers to resist with their combustion. No? And in, why I say it's cheating? Um, I smoke cigars. I love to smoke cigars. So when people say you're smoking a cigar, but you're, but you're emitting CO2, I say no because I have captured the CO2 from, from the atmosphere, the leaves of the, of the plant of tobacco has captured the CO2 that I'm releasing now. That's a little bit the same theory uh, of, of e-fuels and synthetic fuels. You, you capture and then you emit back, which is carbon neutral. Yeah, 
but but again, it's it doesn't feel as good as having solar energy and using it on an electric car. Um, there is there is the there is resistance back there, uh, but you know slowly basically what we need to go is on all in the same direction and and, and you know we get to this mix of solutions that will be the the, the final the final answer. <laughs> That gave us a laugh in the studio. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, Raji, I want to ask you about last mile delivery. Yeah. Just, you know, I think everyone understands is a critical component to seeing the package delivered to your door and probably the area most ripe for really kind of interesting innovation. Where do you see drones happening in Aramex's future? Well, I know. Uh, as a company, we usually tend to look at future technologies and t test the minute they come out. Uh, we had some experience two, three years back, but still, it's you know, drones is not easy to implement. It requires regulations. It requires you know the technology to be available in the countries where where, where we are operating in. But definitely, the minute drones are available, Aramex is going to be there because you know they save a lot of time, less uh, fuel consumption, especially. And now, for our electric vehicles currently in Jordan, we have a solar farm that charges the vehicle, so it's a it's a zero emissions operation. Uh, in Dubai already we have two solar farms, we are just waiting for the electric vehicles to come. So we try to, to look at new technologies and implement the minute the, the technology is available and it makes you know sense for us. Right, you manage a solar and a wind portfolio. Can you talk a little bit more? I think that that would be surprising to some people about the role that that plays in Aramex's operations, just briefly. Well, our strategy says whatever technology is available, regulations allow, we go renewable energy immediately. And that's uh, that, that's something that we are working on. We have Jordan now. We have UAE. We are looking at Saudi now. We are looking at Egypt. Uh, we are looking at our offices. We have two offices, uh, one in the UK and one in Netherlands also. Uh, we are looking at South Africa. We are looking at India. So wherever the regulation allows and uh, technology is available, we move immediately there. Uh, our plan is, you know, as I said, Jordan, I cover around 92% of my consumption from solar uh, farms. So um, Dubai, each solar farm would cover around 60% of the uh, warehouse uh, consumption, which is the warehouse is around 40,000 square meters. So the, 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 the strategy is there, electric vehicles or I mean, uh, low emission vehicles and renewable energy immediately. Uh, plus that, we, we, we look at other innovations. Yani. Uh, you don't need to go uh, with electric truck right now. What, what we are testing uh, now in Dubai is a Euro 6 truck, which will cut also emissions by 20, 25% using, using uh, Euro 6 fuel that is extracted from cooking oil. So that's another area we look at. Our time is brief. And so I want to close out by having us all sort of be forward looking and think about 2050, which is the date that we've all set as when we magically save planet Earth. And so, Christian, I want to ask you, thinking about looking ahead to 2050, what are some of the most ambitious targets in your mind that still still need to be solved and still still keep you up at night? I think our biggest problem is that we talk so much about 2050 and not about 2025. Because if we do not get it done in this decade, we have a much bigger problem than we believe. So this is why I would say focus really on getting things done and start now, today, to get emissions down. Uh, otherwise, you fool yourself. Ravi, quickly over to you. Raji, well, sorry. Uh, same here. Uh, 2050 is too long from now. And we don't want other COP26 and reducing usage of fossil fuels. We want cutting fossil fuels as much as we can and move into renewables. Alejandro, over to you. What do you think? Oh, I'm sorry. We're in 2022 when people oh, are sorry. still on mute. I am on mute. <laughs> I'm on mute. Right. I was just saying very quickly. Yes. Transportation, but also direct carbon capture will be the keys to, to achieve any kind of goal. Sorry. One more time for the cheap seats and back. So what I was saying is transportation and sorting transportation is a big part of the solution. But without direct to air carbon capture, I don't think we will achieve the targets even in 25 or in 2050. I think we need a combination of both. Without that, there's already too much CO2 in the atmosphere to reach any kind of target. We have to take it out. Alejandra, thank you so much. And Raji, Christian, thank you for being here this evening. Pleasure. Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week, thank you for hosting us. And if I had to sum up what we heard here tonight, aviation is craving an alternative fuels market. 
there is going to be no silver bullet from hydrogen. This needs to be a mixed use approach and carbon capture. And also, interestingly, Alejandro's uh, cigar habit. <laughs> Thank you.